This video covers fungi for the Irish Leaving Cert. It is not a replacement for any textbook. Fungi truly are fascinating. They are actually more genetically closer to animals than they are to plants. All life on the planet evolved from one common ancestor and the tree of life is a diagram used to represent the branching events. The tree of life is a diagrammatic representation of how the kingdoms evolved and evolutionary biologists, their work is helping us to add in branches to determine when different species evolved within those kingdoms. On this tree of life, there was a branching event which led to the formation of the plant kingdom. The animal and the fungi kingdoms were formed independently when they branched from some type of common ancestor, we think it was some type of protist. This accounts for the genetic closeness between fungi and animals, so a fungus is more genetically related to an animal than it is to a plant. The branch of science that covers the study of fungi is known as mycology, and a mycologist is a fungi specialist. In the course of your studies, you encounter two forms of fungi. The unicellular yeast on the left, and then the mushroom on the right. The characteristics of the fungi kingdom. Fungi are eukaryotic. So their cells contain a membrane-bound nucleus and membrane-bound organelles. Now it's very important to note that no fungi contains any chloroplasts in their cells. And if there are no chloroplasts, there's no chlorophyll. And if there's no chlorophyll, it means that they can't make their own food. Therefore, fungi are heterotrophic. They cannot make their own food. They have to take in their food from another outside source. Some fungi are parasites or parasitic. They basically get their food from a living host and they usually cause it harm. If they are not parasites, then they're saprophytic, meaning that they feed off dead organic matter. They're acting as decomposers and they play a vital role in returning nutrients to the soil. Fungi have cell walls made of this substance called chitin. Chitin is not found in the plant kingdom at all. In fact, plants can detect chitin and when they do, they switch on their defense systems. It's a way of guarding against fungal infection. Amazing. You have two fungi to learn about in detail, the first of which is rhizopus, otherwise known as bread mold. Rhizopus is saprophytic or a saprophyte, meaning that it feeds on dead organic matter. It's usually found growing on bread and on fruit. On now to the structure of rhizopus. It's made up of these thread-like filaments. And one of these filaments is known as a hypha. The wall of this hypha is made of a material known as chitin. This thread-like filament known as a hypha that makes up the rhizopus is multinucleate, meaning it has many nuclei. And because these many nuclei are not separated by their own little individual walls or septa, they are said to be aseptate, so there's lots of nuclei floating around together. These many nuclei are haploid, meaning that they contain one set of chromosomes only. One of these filaments is known as a hypha. More than one, and you call them hyphae? A group of hyphae is known as a mycelium, and it's actually what you visibly see when you see mould growing on fruit, the white fluffy stuff. How do they get their nutrients from the bread or the fruit? Well, basically, the hypha secrete digestive enzymes onto their substrate. After the enzymes have done their job, the hypha absorb all the nutrients and assimilate them. Let's take a little closer look at how the rhizopus is actually put together. Rhizopus is made up of many of these vertical or upright hypha known as sporangiophores, and to help you remember their name, think of Luke Skywalker from Star Wars with his lightsaber held upright. Sporangiophores! At the top of these sporangiophores you'll find these sporangiums, these little sacs filled with haploid spores. Going in the opposite direction, going down into the substrate, are the rhizoids, a type of hypha that burrows down into the substrate. Think of orpharizoids, or for roots, and their job is to increase the surface area for absorption of the nutrients when they're digested. A type of hypha that grows along the top of the substrate is known as a stolon. Think of the burglar stealing away. These stolons help the fungus to spread, and they also can secrete those digestive enzymes, so they're aiding in that way too. Next up is reproduction. The two ways or the two modes in which they reproduce is asexual and sexual reproduction. However, they mostly reproduce asexually. Let's go through asexual reproduction first. Asexual reproduction in rhizopus is by means of spores, otherwise known as sporulation. We have these vertical hypha known as the sporangiophores and at the top of them is this structure known as the sporangium. 
The sporangium is filled with haploid spores. These spores were formed by mitosis. Eventually, the sporangium containing these haploid spores will split and release them. They'll be carried by the wind, and if they land on a suitable substrate, they'll germinate into a haploid hypha. Just to draw your attention to two labels that you have to include on your diagram, at the top of the sporangiophore is a swelling known as the apophysis. On the top of the apophysis is the columella. Now it's on to sexual reproduction. Sexual reproduction in rhizopus will take place when you have two chemically different strains, so two hypha that are chemically different. One is the plus and the other is the minus. These chemically opposite strains will develop swellings. The swellings will grow to eventually touch. And when they touch and fill with nuclei, they are known as progammatangia, or each one is a progammatangium. Next, cross walls form, blocking off those nuclei and preventing them from going anywhere. Now they're known as gametangia. The wall separating the two gametangia dissolves, and those nuclei from the chemically opposite strains fuse, forming many diploid zygote nuclei. These diploid zygote nuclei get surrounded by a zygospore. Don't forget to include those suspensors in your labelled diagram. So at the end of this process, we have a diploid zygospore. The zygospore gets released and can lie dormant for a very long time, but eventually it will undergo germination by means of meiosis. So there's been meiosis and germination takes place and this haploid hypha grows out of the zygospore. Just drawing your attention again to the fact that the hypha is haploid. So a sporangiophore develops and at the top of this will be your sporangium and inside the sporangium will be these haploid spores. These spores that were produced are genetically varied because they were originally formed by means of sexual reproduction. So as in asexual reproduction, they'll get released and if they land in a suitable substrate, well, they'll grow into hypha. On now to yeast, the other type of fungus you need to know a little bit about. Yeast is unicellular, there are no hyphae. Yeast has a cell wall made of chitin, it has one nucleus, it has a dense grainy cytoplasm, it has food vacuoles, and it also has a large central vacuole. So if you're asked to draw a yeast diagram or to label one, these are the labels you must have. Cell wall made of chitin, food vacuole, nucleus, dense grainy cytoplasm, and a large vacuole. Yeast reproduces by means of asexual reproduction. This method is known as budding. It begins with a yeast cell undergoing mitosis to produce two identical nuclei. One of these new nuclei moves into a bud. It either nips off, producing two identical separate yeast cells, or if it doesn't nip off, it forms a colony. What is the economic significance of fungi? Fungi have many economic benefits. Firstly, they're a food source, so you have edible mushrooms and you have those delicacies, truffles. Yeast is used in the brewing and the baking industries. Most importantly, fungi are used in the production of antibiotics and we have Fleming to thank for that. The disadvantages of fungi. Fungi can cause many diseases, such as athlete's foot. We in Ireland know only too well the devastating impact of fungal disease on crops. In Ireland, we know only too well about the potato blight. However, there are lots of other fungal diseases which can destroy crops. Some fungi can actually eat away at the wooden structure in buildings and houses, causing them to crumble. This is known as dry rot. Students often get confused with what mushrooms are, so let's just go over that for just a second, just for your own information. Mushrooms are the fruiting bodies of fungi, so basically anywhere there's a mushroom underground will be a mass of mycelium. These mushrooms, or these fruiting bodies, will grow up from the mycelium in the ground, and in the cap of the mushroom, there will be thousands of spores produced. Underneath the cap of the mushroom are the gills, and they're responsible for dispersing those spores and basically spreading them around. To make this video interesting, I had to delve a little bit deeper, and I watched some really interesting programs, and I'd just like to put them out there for you. I really enjoyed the Paul Stamets TED Med talk on fungi. It really did make me want to research them even further. The talk discusses turkey tails, a type of fungus which is used in treatment of cancer and how it boosts the immune system. How oyster mushrooms are being used to clean up oil spills. How the next generation of potent antiviral drugs are being developed using fungi. I really enjoyed the BBC documentary, The Magic of Mushrooms, and in fact, the BBC in general, particularly BBC Earth, has amazing articles on fungi. 
I never knew how you could identify two identical looking mushrooms. Basically, they have their own individual fingerprint or spore print. You cut the cap off the mushroom, you put it down on a piece of paper, and the spores will project a particular pattern with a particular colour. I also learned that the fastest organism on the planet is actually a fungus. It's called the hat thrower and it's found growing on cow pats. And I also learned that the largest organism on the planet is actually a fungus covering the Blue Mountains in Oregon. It's called the honey fungus. I don't know about you, but I certainly think that fungi are fantastic. I hope the video helped. It does not replace your textbook. Uh, you have to do your own questions, so best of luck.